everyone. Thanks for joining in. Today, I'll talk about how IntelliJ IDEA can help you work with some of the latest Java language features, like pattern matching for instance of switch expressions, pattern matching for switch, sealed classes, everyone's favorite, records, and text blocks. I'll cover why you need these features, how you can use them in your applications, and what are the benefits. Before I get started, quick introduction. I work as a developer advocate with JetBrains. I'm a Java champion, and I have authored multiple books on Java, a lot of them on Java certification, because I strongly believe that writing Java certification can take your skills to the next level. And just in case, if you do not know already, you can now write just one exam to become a certified Java developer. I also co-lead the Daily Java user group Women Who Code Daily Chapter, and the publication of Technology Crit, a monthly newsletter. For all the code demonstrations that I would do today, I am using the latest version of IntelliJ IDEA, which is 2021.2 beta. The final version would be released later this month. And you can use these links to download the version that you want for your development. Let me start with pattern matching for instance of which applies pattern matching to the instance of operator. This feature was added to Java 16 as a standard language feature, which means you can use it in your production code. There are no more changes planned for this feature. And there is more pattern matching in Java 17 with switch statements and expressions and Java 18, which talks about record patterns and array patterns. Let me hop on to IntelliJ IDEA. Before you get started, make sure you are using the right version of the JDK for your project. I would be using Java 17 language features, so I've set the uh, project SDK to 17 and language level to 17, and this applies to modules as well. And using this dialog box, you can also download and configure your JDK. You can choose the version and the vendor. So let me start with an example of working with instance of operator without pattern matching. So this is a method, output value in uppercase, which expects an instance of type object. And I want this method to print out the value in uppercase if the value that I pass to it is of type string. So let me start with the if statement. I say if object is an instance of string, now, what do I want to do? I want to create a local variable, let's say str, and I want to cast the method parameter object to uh, string. And then I want to print out this value in uppercase. So, in these lines, there is an obvious redundancy. I compare object with string and if this is true i create a local variable and i cast it to the type string of course uh, you would say that you could also do something like this of course you could do that but look at the number of the opening and closing parentheses this becomes difficult to read and understand of course if you have multiple instances of this what can we do? How can we use pattern matching for instance of? So let me add the pattern variable here. So this is the pattern variable which is defined right after the type string with the instance of operator so that I don't have to define a local variable where and local variable and do the casting. The scope of str is limited to the if block here. Because if I try to access it in the else part, let's say if I say str dot, let's say to lowercase. So this doesn't work because this is not accessible in the else block. If you think that this helps you to get rid of just one line of code, let me show you another example. So let's see. Uh, Let's work with class monitor. The equals method first compares the object that you pass to it with monitor and then defines a local variable 
and it has if statement to compare the individual values with of model and price as a developer you would see similar code at a lot of places let's see how pattern matching can help let me replace this with a pattern variable and if you see IntelliJ idea highlighting text with yellow background that means it has some suggestions for you let me see let me simplify this one and I have another change to make I can replace that with the ampersand now let's see how the code changed so this is the code which we had earlier and this is what we have now if you are not convinced let me show you another example so I have this okay so this is another method the method is process let's see how we can change it use pat matching for instance of and also some other refactorings by IntelliJ IDEA and other code analysis inspections so let me first replace this with instance of I can merge the two ifs here I can use alt and enter and I say merge the nested ifs then again I have two ifs one is here the other one follows right next so let me merge this as well now I see this call with a yellow background let's see what IntelliJ idea has for me okay I want to use this one and what else can I do I can also inline this variable right so what do I get so let me rearrange the code let me show you how the code changed so this was the method that we had earlier and this is what we have now does that make you wonder how you could use simple changes which are offered by pattern matching for instance of and change the rest of the code now let me talk about switch expressions which enhances the switch statements it was the first language feature to be introduced as a preview language feature in Java 12 now added as a standard language feature in Java 14 again let me show an example to see what was the problem with the switch statements and why we need switch expressions this is a simple example the method name is get damage to planet which accepts a method parameter of type single-use plastic which is an enum so we're basically trying to find out how much damage are you doing to the planet by using single-use plastic items so this has a switch statement which accepts a parameter of type plastic and depending on the values that you pass to it it would assign a value to the local variable damage and it uses a break statement to break out of the case label so what are the problems multiple problems here first the repetition here the variable name damage is used multiple times and the same is the case with the break statement the other thing is what happens if I delete the break statement here I just introduced a logical error which you can detect if you have test with good code coverage you have test that was a meme so you're supposed to laugh because it's it's an online thing I, I don't know whether you're laughing or not okay so let me go back let let me undelete the break statement and let me go to my test and see whether the test are passing okay so let me run the test I have a couple of tests which run for uh, uh, the values that I pass to this method bottle cup and straw so complete code coverage so let me go back to my class and let me delete this so basically I'm introducing a logical error now let me go back to my test and then run the test here now you will see that one of the test will fail which corresponds to the value cup so the expected value is 100 but the actual is 200 so this is what happens when you miss a break statement in the switch statement what happens if let's say I delete this line and what I'm trying to do is I want to execute the same code for two case values but if I'm reading the code there is no way to 
let me know whether it's a logical error or whether it's a mistake or that's the intention of the developer. So that's the second problem that we have. The other problem is if I remove, let's say, one of the values here, I have again no way to find out whether I am testing all the values of the enum because an enum can have exhaustive list of values. So multiple problems there. Let's see how the switch expression can fix all of this. So first of all, uh, let's see, let's replace the switch statement with expression. Now, can you see how simple and concise the code has become? And of course, it is easy to read too. Let me uh, inline this variable and I can get rid of the default branch as well because I am already testing for all the values. So this is how a switch expression can be used in instead of the switch statement. And in this case, I don't have any repetitions. And if let's say if I delete this one, I would get an error and the error would be the switch expression is not covering all the possible input values, which is good. Now, what happens? Can I um, uh, let's say if I return the same value for two case labels, does it prompt me to do anything? Okay, I see, I see a duplicate branch in switch and I can merge two branches. They make your code more readable, concise, and they do take out a lot, lot of logical errors. That doesn't mean that you have to do away with your uh, test. Of course, you need them. And of course, you can use the switch expressions to return a value, which is unlike the switch statements. You can also execute um, a block of code here rather than just returning value. Uh, let's say I can define a variable, uh, let's, let's say count, and I can use yield to return the value. Now let's look at pattern matching for switch which enhances the switch statements and expression introduced as a preview language feature in Java 17. Let's again, let's work with an example to understand why we need it. This is an example method get damage accepts an instance of type object and iterates over the type of the object OBJ. In this case, there is a difference because when we were talking about uh, the switch expressions, we could iterate on the types, on the values of the enum. As we know until now, switch only accepts certain kind of values uh, like int, char, byte, short, enum, and string, and the corresponding wrapper classes. But how do we deal with this code which looks similar to what we would like to do with a switch, but with types of the values, not the exact values. This is where pattern matching for switch comes in. So let's see how I can use pattern matching for switch in this case. This is how I can define a switch expression, which uses the type as the case label. And this is followed by the pattern variable as we have seen with the pattern variable for instance of and the scope of this variable would be limited to the code that we have on the right side of the arrow. Uh, doesn't matter if that's a block or the single line of code, the scope would be limited to that part. There's another feature which is of handling the null values. Until now, there was no provision in the switch expression or statement to handle the null value as a case label. So what the developers were used to were used to doing something like this. If OBJ is equal to null, then probably do something like something like this. But now you can handle the null as a value and I can have this as a case label. I can say case null and I can say return minus one. 
you can see that the code is in red because this version of IntelliJ IDEA doesn't support this feature as of now. This release is a bit tricky to support all the Java 17 features because Java 17 would be out in September and we are already ready to ship. So most of the Java 17 features would be supported in another month. And let me call this method here. I'm using Maven to compile and package this class and I would use the terminal to execute it. Now let me get the terminal up and I'm using the enable review. Okay, so I get the value as 300. Now, what else can we do? I also want to talk about the guarded patterns which have been added to uh, pattern matching for switch. In this case, I can have uh, a condition here and I can say if pollution dot get AQI is greater than 99, then uh, return this value to me. Let's uh, duplicate this one and here I want to add two more values and see what I get. Now again, let me package and then I would run my class using the terminal that I have in IntelliJ IDEA. Right. So the build is done. Let me get my window and let's see what it prints. So as you can see, it prints 300, 100 and minus one. So we just talked about pattern matching for switch where you can have your case labels as the types of the classes, not just the values. You can also handle null and you can have guarded patterns and there are a lot of other details as well. Now let's work with the Sealy classes and interfaces added to Java 17 as a standard language feature. The language syntax of these features allows you to restrict and control which of the classes or interfaces can extend or implement your classes and interfaces. But why would you want to do so? This feature allows you to define the hierarchies in your application, which align better to the business model so that you don't have to deal with the code or the types or the classes that you do not expect to handle or you do not want to handle. Let's work with an example. Let's assume you are creating an application for gardeners or farmers which work with a certain type of plants, let's say herb, shrubs or climbers, and you do not want to support plants like the aquatic plants. So how do you do that? I already have the hierarchy in place. Let's view the hierarchy. So this is what I'm talking about now. Now let's look at one of the classes, which is Gardener, which shows how you might want to process the instances of this hierarchy. Depending on the type of value that is passed to method process, you might want to call different methods. The problem in this code is the else part that you as a developer would have to define, even though you know that this code block would never be reached because of course, due to the type of hierarchy you have defined, or it could be reached in future. Let's say if an another developer defines a plant, say aquatic plant, which extends class plant, what would you do then? The answer is why not seal the hierarchy of class plant? Why not define declaratively? which other classes can extend class plan. In that case, we would not need the else part. Let me go back to class plant and seal it by using the action seal class in IntelliJ IDEA. This is how the declaration of the seal class plant will change. It would require you to declare the subclasses that can extend plant. By default, IntelliJ IDEA would define all the subclasses as non-sealed, but they can change to be either final or seed. 
a non-sealed class can be extended further without requiring you to declare its subclasses in the declaration. When you define an extended class as a sealed class, it has to follow the same rule as we followed for the class plant. Now let's go back to class gardener and see how we can use the sealed plant here. We can't do much about the if else construct in this case because that's how the language is uh, created. Probably it might change in one of the future Java versions. We don't know. So let's see how we can use pattern matching for switch with the sealed classes. And this is how we can define what action to take when a certain type of plant is passed to this method. As, as you can see, there are no else part or the default cases for, uh, for the values that we do not know or we don't expect. There are modifications to the Java API with respect to the sealed classes and interfaces. Like the constant DESA is now defined as a sealed interface. If you go to the uh, declaration, you can see that this is defined as a sealed interface. Also, the class class defines other methods like is sealed and get permitted subclasses. Now let's talk about records one of very popular recent Java language features. It lets you define a new type in Java to model your data classes in a concise way. Let's work with an example. Imagine you want to encapsulate and persist data for say a person with a name and age. Let's try to do this with a regular class. I can use Alt and Enter and create class person and change this to name and age. I could create the fields for this data and I could also create the getters. Now let me add equals and hash codes and this hardly took me a few seconds to create a full fledged class because IntelliJ IDEA helped me to do that. But what happens if when someone reads this class, there is no way to tell to the other person that this is just an encapsulation of these two fields and the other methods have been generated. What we can do is instead of creating this class as a regular class and then providing all the methods, let me delete this class and let me create this as a record. Again, I get the option of changing this to name and age. This single line of code works as good as what we just created, the full-fledged class with getters, toString, hash code and equals method because all those methods would be generated for a record when it is compiled. So let's go back to the class. Okay, since we're trying to persist this object, let me implement the serializable interface. And let's see if we can run this class. So this works fine. I can see that I can write this instance the person instance to a file and I can read that too. So when you use records, you use the same. This is how you would create the instance of your class. A lot of time you would hear that you must override the hash code and equals method. Let's see what happens if we don't, because that's one of the reasons why we should be using records. So let me go to this class. A simple class in which the main method defines a list of points and then it tries to retrieve a point from the list. Now let me go and show the definition of the class point to you. It has two fields, a constructor and getters, two string method but no hash code or equals method. So 
let's run and see what happens to this class so this class is not able to find this point even though the values match 12 and 19 let's go back to the point class and implement the equals and hash code method right now let me go back to this class and run it now now you would see the value true because when you do not override the equals and hash code method that affects how you retrieve the values from your collection classes now let me show let me go back to the person record and see what else can we do now i can generate a constructor for my record i can say whether i want a compact or a canonical constructor when i use the canonical constructor i get the parameters which are passed to it and why would i want to do so let's say perhaps i want to check whether the values pass certain criteria let's say i uh, i say if age is less than zero then perhaps you have to throw new illegal argument exception and else i want to execute this code so this is why i might want to define um, a constructor for it what else can i do with the record i cannot define fields because i should be defining the state of the record using the components if i try to do that the code will not compile let's say let's say if i say string address this will not compile because uh, uh, this is not allowed but static fields and static methods are allowed and instance methods are also allowed the state of records is truly immutable you cannot change it via reflection as well so if you have been using um, reflection to change the value of private final fields you must stop doing that now so this is a class in which so this is uh this is not a record that's a regular class but uh point is a record now point is a record and let's see if i can change the value for non-records and for the records let me execute this class now you would see that the code could change the final private field for notebook which is not a record but that the same could not be done for class point a lot of you might be using jackson to to persist records so this is how you can do that and let's see if we can get this working yes it does I already have the dependencies in my form.xml. If you are using an older version of Jackson, you might need to add annotations to your field so that Jackson can persist your data. And this is what I mentioned. You can use annotations with the components of your record like this. Now, the last feature that I want to cover in the session is text blocks, which is the multi-line string values. Let's work with an example. Strings are great to store multiple type of values. Let's say I have a, a variable in which I store uh, some value. Let's say this is a small string, but I see that it is growing in size. Um, still, okay but what if it starts using other like the double quote and then is 
when the problem starts with all the escape sequences right so what if i want to use a double quote and then i use it like this so this is just one uh, double quote problem really starts when you have something like let's say json and you assign it uh, so what can we do if i define a text block i can start it with three double quotes and end it with three double quotes and then i can just copy paste my value the json value in the text blocks now this looks so much legible than this one you can also use other values like uh, html let me just copy paste this value here and this one interesting thing i can also inject language or reference as i can do with the regular string and if i say that this is json i also get the errors that i can see in the json value now i missed a comma which i can fix now so this is another benefit of using text blocks of course it's um, it's easier to read write and you can also use uh, language or reference injection now the other thing is about the leading and the trailing spaces you can see a green vertical line here which marks what all spaces would be added to this text block if i move this to the left the vertical line moves to this means this space would be included as part of my text blocks similarly if i am talking about the trailing spaces the spaces at the end of the line are deleted automatically so if you want to add them you can use this delimiter and uh, as i mentioned you can use multiple types of data to store in your text blocks like your html your uh, json even your sql queries or the code which you might have written in other language and of course other multi line string values which use a lot of double codes thanks for watching